realize that I think the world believes that the EU-Ukraine recent summit was, was, was highly successful, uh, that the Ukrainian World Congress, which represents Ukrainian communities in over 65 countries around the world, is very committed to Ukraine's EU and Euro-Atlantic integration. Uh, we have many communities, and our, and our Ukrainian communities in the European Union are growing. Uh, there are millions of Ukrainians now living in, Ukraine, in, in, the, in the EU, and uh, they are very much committed to working with uh, policymakers, parliamentarians to, uh, uh, to promote Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. What's really clear uh, needed is on both on the Ukrainian side and the EU side is a very clear roadmap uh, to Ukraine's EU integration. And I think that the summit was certainly a step in the right direction. And that we as a uh, civil society are firmly committed to Ukraine's uh, European and EU integration as well as NATO integration. And we, uh, as uh, the Ukrainian World Congress, uh, have been and will continue to hold both sides to account, both the European Union and Ukraine to account to fulfill the objectives for this important uh, integration for the value, for the purposes of and benefits of uh, the people of Ukraine and of Europe. So thank you for those uh, for the opportunity and uh, thank you all for joining us, uh, both those that are participating as panelists and those that are listening in. Thank you, Odessio, for chairing this and moderating this session. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry that I omitted to mention that our uh, conversation is also interpreted simultaneously into Ukrainian. And for those joining us from Lutsk and from other cities, as I can see from the chat, please go at the interpretation little globe icon on Zoom and choose Portuguese. Uh, this is the code name for Ukrainian. We know that the Zoom upgraded it now. The new version includes Ukrainian. Uh, but at this stage, we're still using Portuguese as a icon for Ukrainian, but yes, we have a simultaneous translation. So um, we, we, we proceed uh, and, and would like to invite a member of European Parliament, Vitor Vashchikovsky, who is the co-chair of the European Parliament's delegation to the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Association Committee. Mr. Vashchikovsky is joining us from Poland, and I'm sure as a neighbor of Ukraine, as a close observer of uh, how this um, uh, difficult path of integration evolves uh, will give his perspective on the results of the summit and where both partners can move ahead. Mr. Vashchikovsky, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can see me and can hear yes. me. Yes, we can see well. Thank you for, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for organizing this, uh, this meeting. <coughs> Одразу саміттю України з перед місцевими виборами в Україні. Ми не дивуємося з того, що європейський парламент тепер опікується більше вашою сусідкою Білоруссю, тому що тут склалися дуже складні обставини для білоруської Опозиції, і чи вони програють, чи виграють, поки що не ясно. Але, безперечно, ті, хто опікується і трудиться цими зв'язками між Європейською. I would like to say, first of all, that it's a little bit confusing because I was uh, hoping to refer and to comment uh, the message <coughs> coming from, <coughs> excuse me, coming from uh, the, the Vice Prime Minister. So uh, maybe I will take uh, floor again in the next part of, uh, of the meeting to, to refer to the message. But uh, let me start first that <clears throat> Whenever we have a chance to discuss the, the problem of uh, Ukrainian road to European Union, I remind my Western colleagues that first the past was quite difficult, the past, the history was very difficult. I have to remind my colleague about the Maidan 2004 and uh, about Maidan 2014, the bloody one. Uh, for, of course, uh, due to Maidan 2014, you earn um, you know, important prices like uh, you know, uh, association agreement, like DCFTA, but of course you paid uh, you know, enormous price. 
uh, Eros Crimea, uh, Eros Donbas, and of course, um, the most important uh, Eros people, uh, Nibiesna Soknia uh, and others. Uh, so when I was the Minister of Foreign Affairs and I had the chance to visit Ukraine many times, I always uh, paid tribute to those who, uh, who, who fought uh, during the Maidan 2014 and then in Donbass, uh, who, 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 who were buried in the Ukrainian cemetery. So we have to remember the past. We have to remember that for the last six years, uh, Ukraine is marching through the difficult uh, reforms, uh, anti-corruption reforms, uh, central reforms, uh, local authorities, municipal uh, reforms. And finally, we have pandemia, which uh, hit our lives. And everything is going on simultaneously to the ongoing uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. I always refer to this as the war between Russia and Ukraine, and I'm trying to correct my Western colleagues, not only in the European Parliament, but everywhere, that uh, we cannot speak about the crisis in Ukraine. We have to emphasize that there is an ongoing war. So if they complain about the speed of your reforms in Ukraine, they have to be reminded that uh, uh, partly uh, uh, responsible for the for this uh, uh, lack of reforms or slow speed of the reform uh, is a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Now about the <clears throat> about the summit, I will I, I, I would say there is, there was no breakthrough. Unfortunately, to, 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 to say maybe maybe pandemia is uh, supposed to be blamed again, but uh, future of uh, of uh, relations between Ukraine and uh, and European Union is still is a bumpy road and uh, and uncertain, and that's that's another message which I emphasize all the time that we found the clear perspective of membership in European Union for Ukraine. There will be problem uh, with reform. There are problems with reform, and there will be problems with reform. So we have to create a clear perspective. For us, for instance, in Poland uh, and Central Europe, this is uh, very difficult to accept that Turkey, which is mostly located outside of Europe, can be accepted uh, to uh, European Union. Uh, earlier than Ukraine. No, mm -hmm. Ukraine is uh, much more important. European, it's fully European country and accession process was supposed to be uh, because we are expecting this uh, local elections uh, next, uh, next Sunday. So we expect very fragmented political scene in, in Ukraine. And I'm very much afraid that the pro-Russian forces may start regaining the position. And this process may lead to some kind of an anti-Maidan, pro-Russian Maidan. I don't want to say literally Maidan like a manifestation in Kyiv, mm -hmm. but uh, the process of turning back the reforms and turning back Ukraine from the pro-European force to the pro Russian force. So this is my, this is what worries me uh, before the election, local election. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yes, indeed. I, I think all of us will be watching the results of the elections and what it means for the future of Ukraine's reform. Uh, and we can discuss it in the Q&A. And it's great that you can stay with us, Mr. Wojciechowski. Please do stay and uh, you'll, you, you'll be able to engage later after the Vice Prime Minister. But the, right now, I would like to bring in our guest from Vilnius, the member of European Parliament, Petra Zastrevichus. Petra Zastrevichus, who um, unfortunately has to leave a bit earlier. So he, we, we, we agreed to bring him into the conversation at this point. So uh, Mr. Zastrevichus, uh, over to Vilnius, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody from Vilnius. Uh, we have a sunny uh, late um, uh, October day. Uh, it's a busy Friday, once again, uh, there are so many issues around, but focusing on Ukraine. Indeed, uh, my pleasure to talk once again to my good friends and uh, partners uh, I know already for, <clears throat> for years. Um, if to make the reference, I mean, to the very last uh, association uh, 
Council twenty um, uh, second already in a row. I think the uh, taking at least uh, conclusions out of the joint statement, which was issued on the 6th um, of October. It's a very sound document. It's a substantial document. It, it's not just speaking about uh, general things as sometimes when you have nothing to lay down. I mean, you, you start speaking about uh, uh, weather and, um, uh, and water and, <laughs> and nothing more. So this is a very, I would say, specifically designed and um, uh, well uh, uh, worded uh, document, which means that uh, there are things moving on the ground, in spite, uh, rightly uh, said by uh, Witold Wojciechowski, that um, Ukraine is facing uh, Russian aggression, and unfortunately, it become as business as usual. Uh, absolutely, that's the Russian strategy. I mean, to enforce. Uh, constraints on the countries, I mean, trying to change the course, political course, influence people's uh, uh, minds and so on and so forth. But in spite of all, above uh, pandemia, Ukraine was able, I think, to present uh, some good uh, evidence of uh, uh, reforms process, uh, which is on the way. Maybe not in each and every field, uh, the achievements are uh, very much uh, um, up to uh, expectations, but nevertheless, I think the, the first sentence which reconfirms um, continued commitment to strengthening political association and economic integration is the right word, continued, because uh, I don't think the present state of our relations is enough. No, it's not enough. So that's why we have to look uh, deeper what we have to accomplish. So that's why I think it's, it's not enough sometimes in, in EU papers to make the reference to existing lines in the agreements, in a previous statements. Uh, you know, it was a bit painful even to quote uh, uh, the text of uh, association agreement. Unfortunately, some member states are not probably willing to move forward. But step by step, we have to insist on uh, this broader concept of Europeization of Ukraine and uh, according uh, uh, participation of European Union in it. On what I'm happy, by the way, uh, looking at this paper, it speaks so much about the sectorial cooperation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's be frank. I mean, general language is not enough for Ukraine, for Ukrainians. We need more economic and sectorial cooperation, which is essentially important for Ukraine to get an access to the economic uh, power uh, of uh, the European Union, na namely single market, and making the reference to the digital uh, um, um, kind of uh, cooperation and digital union uh, cooperation, making the reference to the uh, climate change uh, cooperation, even aviation agreement is, are so important in this regard. And the more specific issues every time will be mentioned in the uh, uh, statements, joint statements after association agreements, it's a real sign things are moving. Yes, and finally, um, you know, for me, maybe three messages would be important, I mean, to, to present to you. First of all, we need broad and very dynamic political dialogue, and we do have it. I have to express my appreciation to the Ukrainian side uh, on complete solidarity on the uh, policy line on Belarus. I know it was not easy. It's not automatic, but it took some time, but nevertheless, you, uh, Kiev came out uh, absolutely aligned with the Brussels and uh, main, uh, main EU capitals. Congratulations. It's, it's a good sign of partnership, understanding, and taking care of your neighbor because Belarus needs our solidarity and support. Secondly, gradual integration into economic single, uh, single market. This is at most important. I mean, I know, there are some protectionist uh, tendencies on the EU. Just recently, I heard in some committees uh, unwillingness to open up, for example, seed market for, uh, for Ukrainian products. I know it will be from time to time such a message, but we have to move forward with the proved quality um, uh, confirmatory assessment agreement, which must be um, signed uh, as soon as possible, and so on and so forth. And finally, targeted assistance on setting new 
security cooperation. We do need uh, next level security and defense cooperation between European Union, which is more and more turning uh, certain uh, policy lines on defense union, establishing defense union, with the Ukraine one. Because Ukraine has a capacity, potential, research, production, and need, first of all, a need for security assistance um, because of um, uh, East and, uh, and South. So we have to do it uh, as much as possible. And finally, EU must remain committed to Europeanization of Ukraine. It's a broad, long-term prospect, but we have to understand what it's about. And from Ukraine side, what we uh, expect, indeed, stay committed on uh, implementation, implementation, because that's a key word in this regard, and reforms. I know how painful it is. So that's why, all in all, my assessment is positive, uh, in spite of all and additional uh, difficulties as pandemia. But nevertheless, uh, I think it's a, it's a great um, initiative taken by Ukrainian World Congress, uh, uh, representation of Ukraine, to follow up. We need to talk and follow up and find new uh, motivation for our uh, next level cooperation. Thank you so much. Best regards from Vilnius. Thank you so much, Petros. I understand that you have to leave, but you can later watch to. the recording. I, I think it I will, will be available <laughs> of, of our discussion. And I see that the Vice Prime Minister Ola Stefanishin is joining us on the road somewhere. I'm sure it's been a, it's been a busy you. Friday for her. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, Ola, are you ready to connect with us? So do you need a few more seconds to, to gather uh, your thoughts? Uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for being uh, so dramatically late for our online meeting. And I would uh, promise that I would definitely listen in the recording everything which uh, was discussed. I was at president's meeting and we're like leaving our cell phones out of the of the office. So I didn't have an app. Uh, had the opportunity to text uh, so so uh, but anyway extremely happy to join and ready to get engaged immediately and sorry once again excellent excellent i think that uh, it proves to a priority of the european integration and euro atlantic integration if you were at the meeting in in, in banco at the, the office of the president but um what what happened uh, while you were in the meeting we we've heard from the a co-chair of the uh, Ukraine's Parliamentary Associative Com Association Committee and from, uh, from, the, from U a member of European Parliament, Astrevichus, who both said that, uh, you know, Ukraine and EU partnership is, 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 an, evolving, um, is an evolving process. Uh, of course, Ukraine, uh, as a member of the European family, belongs and, 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 and needs more substance, but also Ukraine has to uh, continue on the painful road of reform while being on the front line of the Russian aggression. So maybe if, if you could give us your reflection about the summit, what strikes you as the most important uh, achievement and where would you like to see that bilateral cooperation going forward, Ola? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I absolutely share uh, the uh, uh, this view. And uh, uh, for me uh, personally, as I was only uh, appointed for this position only four months before uh, the summit, the summit was the top priority and we started the preparation immediately. Uh, and um, uh, like uh, this uh, this year's summit uh, and this was the principal message uh, that like we were delivering from ukrainian side the the outcomes of this summit should be a, a personal roadmap both for presidency of the european union and for the president of ukraine you know, their personal involvement in transformations and input into the european integration processes and for me personally it was very important that after the summit I heard from the president that now he has his personal roadmap of European integration. Uh, and uh, that's very important because uh, this is a clear 
sign of a strong political support, which has been also uh, demonstrated uh, by the effectiveness of Ukrainian parliament before the summit, uh, which who voted the legislation which were pending for its adoption for over 10 years and by two previous convocations of the parliament. So it wasn't adopted and the legislation based on implementation of the agreement was adopted and was a huge transformation uh, in our country. Uh, but politically, I think that it was very important that a strong uh, personal communication uh, has taken place uh, over the summit. We're really sorry that Madam President Ursula von der Leyen didn't manage to, to participate, but President had a phone call uh, with, the, uh, with her and the discussion was there and the follow up we saw all, all over the summit. Um, so the personal uh, outreach then, uh, it was very important that uh, this was the first summit when Ukraine and the European Union has reached a political uh, agreement on a many, many things. First of all, as regards the uh, a launch of the update, I think we have, we have lost uh, Mr. Fanishina. The association, very oh, strong okay, political division. And uh, from the other side, uh, Ukraine has been considered as a significant contributor to the EU Green Deal agenda, which is a very new reality we face. Uh, we share the uh, this ambitions, a number of, of very political decisions, but on a sectoral issues were taken, which shows that Ukraine demonstrated over the last months the sustainability and the commitment to deliver on this agenda. But EU has also demonstrated its commitment to uh, engage all the bureaucracy to make sure that these political commitments are addressed. Um, and a very, very last moment, uh, I feel even more inspired after the summit because I'm very busy with implementation of this uh, of this uh, decisions, which shows that there is a, um, a strong energy back in Kiev, but also in Brussels. And I want to thank uh, to colleagues from the European Parliament and European Commission uh, who uh, keep Ukraine uh, in the very top on the agenda and uh, keep the focus on the on these issues. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you will so far stay with us and hopefully you will reach your office by the time we, we carry on this conversation. It's, it's, a, it's a proof of a very dynamic world that, you know, frankly, it's difficult to catch up. But um, uh, thanks for taking your time and uh, speaking to the new energy. I mean, I think uh, we all need new energy because these are very unprecedented and uncertain times. And we understand that it's not a sprint, especially with COVID hitting economies and hitting how we communicate and diplomacy and personal contacts. And, and I think the, the fact that uh, hopefully in the parliament, the, where a lot of decisions have to uh, take place, you'll be able to push this uh, agenda of, of integration because Ukrainian space of implementation of the association agreement slows down perhaps because there are more complicated issues that have to be addressed than, than at the beginning. So you have a lot of um, pushing and pulling in the parliament to do. And uh, I'm sure maybe we can speak about it in Q&A. But now I would like to um, pass the floor to Katerina Maternova, who is the Deputy uh, Director General for Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations. Katerina is the uh, good friend and also an insider uh, of uh, out of all neighborhoods, she knows Ukraine really well, and uh, she's also now uh, leading the EU Ukraine support group that is um, in charge of the structural reforms in Ukraine. Uh, so, Katerina, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Orisia, and uh, Ola, congratulations. I actually have never been on a Zoom call where one of the presenters was in a car and it worked perfectly. So. I think this gives us an inspiration that we can uh, we can uh, uh, multitask even more. So th thank you very much for being able to join us. You can us take a look over Kiev, you know. <laughs> yeah, I did, <laughs> and and it's great also to be um, on the on the panel with esteemed uh, members of the European Parliament. And uh, thanks for the uh, Ukraine World Congress for 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 organizing this. Um, well, uh, both uh, Ola and I were in the in the summit uh, itself in the in the plenary, and I uh, very much subscribe to the notion that it was a success. 
both for the EU and for, can you hear me? Because just to double check, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you well, continue. Okay, yeah. because you were frozen for a second, sorry. Uh, that I very much subscribe to the notion that it was a success. Mr. Vashikowski at the beginning said that there was no breakthrough and uh, with, with, uh, with a sense of disappointment. I would say that it's good there was no breakthrough because we're the, 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 the stage in our relationship where we are now is the much more boring one, which is about not sexy issues that don't really make political headlines like, like uh, agreement on conformity of technical standards or the aviation agreements or, or agreement on how to collaborate in the green transition I mean, those are those are innately boring, uh, boring agendas or technocratic uh, agendas, and and so uh, I'm I'm in fact uh, very very pleased that we had a summit which was filled, as as Petras was also mentioning, with uh, with a lot of concrete steps uh, we can build on. That was the first thing that I I I think was really great and. The, the second one, and uh, Ola now uh, confirmed that, what we wanted to do is to make sure that President Zelensky himself personally and his close collaborators buy into the agenda because he's still relatively new. This was, this was the second summit for him, but the first summit came literally days after his inauguration. So this was the, really the, the first uh, sort of summit after a year. Plus, it was uh, a, a, an opportunity to connect, again, very much at a personal level, also with the new leadership of EU institutions, which also worked. Unfortunately, President von der Leyen indeed uh, could, not, uh, could not participate, so another physical meeting will take place at some point later, but there have been already numerous, uh, numerous telephone and, and, and video exchanges. So I, I think that uh, the success of the summit for me is in charting out concrete areas where we are going to follow up. There is very much on the table uh, from the Ukrainian side and, 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 and the EU side that we need to figure out how to uh, update the agreements that we have, whether the, the, the annexes, et cetera, how to, how, to, how to move that agenda forward. We are doing a pre-assessment of this, this title, I can't even spell out fully, but the, the agreement on, on, on recognition of technical standards by the ACAS, that's, that's, that's uh, happening. We will have a kickoff meeting on the entire Green Deal engagement uh, between, uh, between the Prime Minister Schmigal and uh, Executive Vice President Timmermans that will be then followed up by us at, at operational uh, level to see what are the concrete measures, whether regulatory, whether changing incentives, whether providing support, whether having technical assistance, whether investing in specific transformation to help uh, Ukraine uh, go on the same path as the EU charted itself of having a green recovery from the crisis and, and, and building toward the uh, climate neutrality by, by, by 20, uh, 2050, as ambitious as that goal is. And simultaneously looking how to bring Ukraine together with us on the digital transformation. And when I say digital, it's not only sort of making um, uh, broadband available, but it's also uh, evolving around issues of uh, cybersecurity, uh, ability, resilience to, to hybrid attacks, et cetera, where I think that in fact, Ukraine has lessons to, to share also with the, with the European Union, not only the other way around. Uh, now, one thing that I want to, to, to address uh, briefly is that uh, since President Zelensky uh, came into the office, even, even having a war in the East, and even during the, the uh, COVID crisis, there have been, because there is a lot of sort of narrative, oh, they stopped doing reforms. So I just want to say for the audience that that's really not the case. 
because since him coming into the office uh, just a little over a year ago, uh, there have been very important reforms that happened. We unbundled Naftogas, something that the EU pushed for for a long time and didn't happen before. We launched and made um, functional the High Anti-Corruption Court. Uh, the land reform, sort of adopting an act on uh, on land reform, something that was uh, the third rail of politics in Ukraine for a very, very long time. Banking resolution law and the personal political sort of costs that it entailed uh, to, 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 the, to the president, criminal recriminalization of the illicit enrichment. Those are just few things that happened in the fall, for example, uh, fiscal decentralization, which means giving uh, giving taxing power to the local authorities, etc. So, a lot, a lot uh, has uh, happened. But uh, um, the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. So, obviously, the reforms need to continue, and 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 both formally uh, and and informally during the summit, there there have been strong encouragement for the Ukrainian authorities to continue uh, reforms. There was also, as we always are honest with, uh, with our friends, uh, uh, there, were, there were concerns expressed about, about uh, some aspects of the justice uh, in, in Ukraine and about, about the need to continue uh, closing space for corruption and also move into the prosecution of, of corrupt behavior more effectively than, than so far. So all of these issues were very openly discussed uh, at, as, as they are uh, among friends. And what we have also stressed that, uh, you know, the, 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 the task force that I'm, I, have been, uh, I have been leading since uh, the beginning, so I have sort of the two jobs that Orisia mentioned, We've been, been leading since March is really a very unique one, and I always tell my Ukraine friends to really uh, sort of appreciate that we actually have a task force filled with colleagues from the sectoral uh, parts of the uh, Commission that uh, is re are responsible for for helping with the Ukrainian reform agenda. No other country in the world outside of the EU has such a task force, and. And, and so it's, we are trying to take good advantage of it and together with uh, colleagues in the rest of the Commission and the European External Action Service, um, we are ready to continue our good dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina. I understand you will be staying with us so far, right? Till then. Excellent. So, so uh, I'm sure there will be lots of questions come up. One particularly, I was I was quite uh, curious in the joint statement. There's a there's a reference to we welcome the renewed commitment of Ukraine to fight the influence of vested interests. And if there's any information that that you could share with us, what this kind of roadmap may entail, maybe. Maybe we can come in this in Q and A because that's an interesting language in the joint statement and an important, I think, problem that many Ukrainians feel. Uh, but you know, uh, whenever we talk about EU being a roadmap or an anchor for reforms and modernization in Ukraine, it's important also to understand that Ukrainians, as such, so far don't feel kind of the positive impact of reforms. And it's something to think about. The recent survey saw that like 40% don't feel any impact of reform and 20 say that actually they felt negative. And I was thinking how we can put this human security of Ukrainians, especially right now, you know, with COVID, with the economic collapse in the priorities of uh, how further to develop. And perhaps this, what in Ukraine is no promislovy bez vis or alignment of these um, technical, uh, uh, technical, uh, I think that's called the agreement on conformity assessment and acceptance of industrial products. Yes, it's a very complicated name, but this is the one that would open access for Ukrainian goods to more uh, free access without uh, additional um, certification. Uh, there's lots to lots to do, but I think it's so important to put human security and human economic and climate and environmental security in the middle of it. But, but um, that's just a comment of me. But I think that I, I see that we have new members of European Parliament joining us. And I would like to welcome Viola from 
von Kramen uh, to our discussion. She is also the deputy head of the Ukrainian Parliament's delegation to the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Associative Committee. And of course, recently I noticed in uh, when you follow statements by Viola, she was quite well known in Ukraine for talking about the threats to the visa-free travel and uh, uh, that was something that uh, caused a lot of anxiety, I think, in Ukraine. But it'd be interesting to hear uh, now how you assess it after the summit. And uh, also, you are quite active on Belarus. Uh, about And Belarus, you know, it's right there on the border of Kyiv Oblast. It's not somewhere far away from Ukraine. And what happens in Belarus will have an impact on uh, what happens to Ukraine's security. Uh, and uh, I think this is this a good regional um, take is important for us. So, uh, Ms. von Kramon, I would like to pass the floor to you right now. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to Paul and all the other um, organizers uh, of the Ukrainian World Congress uh, for inviting us, for inviting me um, and the opportunity um, to speak here. Yes, definitely. I would uh, see the uh, situation and the recent development, political development in Ukraine a little bit, <clears throat> let's say, shadier or more critical than uh, Madame um, Maternova. That's for sure. We had already <clears throat> some bilateral uh, exchange about this. Um, of course, nobody will question the significance of the Ukraine, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, EU summit. Uh, that's for sure. It's a vital platform. Uh, it has this um, high, um, um, uh, the high representative and uh, uh, the, the president and the prime minister's exchange opportunity. I think this is of uh, utmost importance. And also the visit of uh, Josep Borrell before to Kiev was even more important to take the time to really behind doors uh, try to um, uh, message what fr from the European side is important and why we stick uh, to our uh, demands for the reform agenda and so on and so forth. Uh, so I guess some of um, the uh, issues will be mentioned in the upcoming report where Michael Egala is the, the rapporteur and many of us are the, the shadows. Uh, we will absolutely and actively uh, contribute uh, to this report. Uh, this will happen uh, due, uh, during the next weeks. Uh, when it comes to, let's say, the Green Deal, um, it's good to hear that, uh, the, the, let's say, the coordination of any kind of technical questions uh, and 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 um, standard uh, standards and so on will be discussed. But so far, I do not see a political will in the Verhovna Rada to even start thinking about um, a vision and how to um, interact with the European Union in terms of Green Deal and how uh, to switch in a in a let's say bigger extent um, to uh, energy independency. Um, I don't see what we do sometimes now, uh, substituting coal uh, with uh, gas is really an alternative and it doesn't match uh, the CO2 um, climate uh, targets at all. So really I ask everyone in the Verhofna Rada and also the domestic investors, the energy suppliers to really get back to the table and think about how a green economy in Ukraine could look like and what it is necessary, especially for the energy intensive um, met metallurgy, um, big uh, industries uh, in the east and in central uh, Ukraine, while we all know how much uh, dependent uh, Ukraine is on those uh, sectors. So there's a lot to do uh, for sure, but uh, to be honest, I'm pretty much reluctant and cautious to say that there's already, let's say, a remarkable start or something political um, uh, from, from results, um, at least not uh, for me. Maybe somebody could um, give me some more insights on this. Um, otherwise, I mean, uh, farming is a big issue uh, and we have just <laughs> had a 
a week of debates on uh, the new common agricultural policy, while we see there the biodiversity strategy does not really match uh, with the new so-called agriculture a common policy and the uh, climate change and biodiversity targets. But anyway, I see that uh, for Ukraine, it should be actually easier. While we see a lot of more, of course, area and extensive used area, you have the black soil uh, opportunity, you have more um, remote areas, uh, uh, you have a lot of more diversity actually uh, in most of the parts of, of Ukraine, and you could match uh, the biodiversity and natural uh, targets there in a, in a more easier way. But, uh, also, I think that needs a little bit of more education and maybe even communication on what's to do. But uh, compared to how uh, farming is uh, is done in, in the Western part, in Germany, especially in some of the very intensified um, animal um, husbandry intensified areas, I think, um, Ukraine has a uh, comparative uh, advantage and should use that uh, in a way and not just copy paste what we have done in terms of mistakes, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, when it comes to the uh, upcoming local elections, um, uh, I have just said in another meeting before, I see there's more diversity for sure. Uh, there are more different smaller independent parties, candidates and so on. And also I, I see that the turnout, not the turnout, the percentage of women uh, who uh, would like to run and to apply uh, for uh, city council and oblast council and, and smaller uh, cities, uh, communities, is uh, higher, which is good. Um, I hope they will succeed because uh, one thing is, of course, empower them to run. And on the other hand, we also have uh, or need to have strategies that they will be voted and that they will be elected and that they get a chance to finally participate in, in politics um, on the local level. Uh, with the success of the decentralization uh, during the last uh, years, we definitely see a more self-confident uh, attitude um, in, in many of the bigger cities, but from Zelensky's side, because they saw that the decrease and the diminishing support for his party uh, tend out to, let's say, obstruct uh, the attempts of the bigger cities to form a new part, a party to, to really become a new power um, in the political landscape. And I think this is a little bit, uh, how to say, um, something we should also criticize uh, from the European level, while actually we can take credit for the decentralization. And we should also give credit to the mayors that they finally um, took up and, and, and used the opportunity of the decentralization also for political uh, power um, and, uh, of course, democratic uh, um, uh, uh, elected, but nevertheless, uh, this is a normal form of competition uh, and we see that uh, Sluga Naroda was playing in some of the cities, not really a, a fair game. Uh, we see a lot of corruption scandals, uh, even um, Mrs. Uh, Matanova said that um, they still stick to the uh, reform agenda. When you look really deep into who is around uh, Mr. Zelensky and who are his advisors, Mr. Yamrak is a crucial figure and I mean, you do not have to go far to really see what Dennis Yarmark is playing and how um, awful his, um, his track record looks like, but nobody tackles and nobody even questioned that, nobody even indicted him. And this is also a kind of impunity, which I do not understand why we let it go. There's no media attention from the Western side to really look into these cases and what it means and also his linkages to Russian media, to Russian business. So I see this extremely critical. The exchange of the general prosecutor, Mr. Rivashaka, did a perfect job. There was nothing to criticize from the legal point of view. But of course, he didn't fulfill the expectation and he wasn't ready to go for a political revenge uh, against Poroshenko. And so he was, um, he was dismissed. But this was an obvious political move. But I think we should openly criticize this. 
N attacks against NABU, uh, I guess that was mentioned before, uh, why I have given this um, press statement because SAPO is important and we need a transparent selection of uh, the prosecutors and this is one of the, let's say, pillars um, of the association agreement yeah, and well, of I, the... I'm, I'm so sorry oh, I'm to too, interrupt. Too long. I'm too, if I'm you too long. If you could just, yeah, because oh, okay. we were asking well, for like three men and uh, contributions. No, no, perfect. I'm, I can finish here. I have a yeah, long okay. list, but I can yeah. finish here. I'm but, fine. I mean, Thank I, you, Alessia. That's you know, okay. I, I think it's important. I think what is what is interesting is that you clearly see some of the progressive um, developments in Ukraine with gender, more gender equality, with the new electoral code. And, uh, and and I think you coming from the Green Party, understanding the, the importance of the green agenda and actually something that Ukrainians are now feel with floodings, with forest fires in uh, in uh, Chernobyl, we've seen forest fires in Luhansk. So I would hope that the current leadership will take on board this agenda as something that uh, that, that is important. And uh, and you know, I, many people share your concern about the speed of rule of law reform. The uh, quality of anti-corruption bodies, which are also new and are being threatened from different uh, directions. But uh, thank you so much, because I think it's only true friends that talk honestly. And, and I think you care for Ukraine and you care for the future of the region, especially how, uh, how Belarus will turn. And many people are looking at Ukraine, how these reforms succeed. So it's important that Ukraine is successful. But I see your, your colleague, Michael Geller, joined, uh, another member of European Parliament from Germany. Uh, and you mentioned you will be working also on, on the report on Ukraine and you are you're quite experienced member of Europe, European Parliament. You've been through many uh, editions or, uh, and convocations. So I'd like to invite now Michael to, to contribute his insights for three minutes, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And apologies for joining only a few minutes ago because I was in another of such conferences uh, uh, on the on the Eastern Partnership and ahead uh, three associate countries ahead of important uh, elections. Indeed, I'm as we speak working on the uh, on the report uh, for Ukraine and um, uh, the, the way uh, the Parliament works is that in the first draft the rapporteur gets very few. Uh, space uh, to express himself and then uh, the rapporteur waits for the input of uh, amendments and I've got I think it was 446 amendments which are currently uh, which have been in the meanwhile uh, well combined and um, and uh, I, I, I checked it all uh, uh, in the different policy uh, areas and um, uh, now uh, the, my shadow rapporteurs, uh, probably as we speak, they will have received this uh, uh, first uh, uh, draft and it will not take long until it reaches all interested stakeholders, of course. Um, uh, I mean, um, I, I do not want, I do not need to, to repeat uh, uh, the, uh, what has already been uh, addressed. I think our commitment stays uh, uh, as it has always been since the revolution of dignity and regardless who is in the government, the agenda, the cooperation agenda for us is the one that uh, implements uh, the DCFDA and association agreement. And in so far, uh, uh, if there is something to be uh, well uh, praised, uh, we will do that. If there is something to be criticized, we'll do that as well, regardless who is there. Uh, in, in government uh, currently, and so far um, we have no no um, bodies uh, which uh, on whom we look nicer uh, from a partisan point of view. I think uh, uh, we we definitely, it, as a parliament as a whole, all those from the different political groups in the parliament uh, will uh, take uh, um, uh, a similar stance uh, in addressing uh, the challenges that Ukraine faces. And now. Um, uh, if I'm taking the, the, the next uh, weekend uh, when there will be local elections, I think um, in my mind uh, we will see hopefully a high turnout. That is always good for any democratic exercise. I wish in spite of COVID that there is a high turnout and that we will uh, see in the outcome uh, a very particular local results. 
uh, it was mentioned probably before I joined and we had it in the pre other meeting that went on in parallel. Uh, indeed, there are many local parties or people who are standing there uh, uh, and presenting either when they have been in office, uh, what they have delivered thus far, also after the uh, amalgamation of, uh, of the, the different uh, gramadas and uh, uh, those people will be able to judge already to an extent who has made, who has delivered better in the one city and uh, worse in another. So even if I were in the ruling party, I wouldn't feel, although they are not so represented in the, on the local level yet, because of course they are new and they focused on, on the national level, um, I wouldn't be either uh, concerned or specific, particularly happy because I think uh, the people are in a position on the local level to judge very much who has delivered and who has not. And I think we will see that there will be people who will be confirmed and those who will be chased away by the voters. And I think that is a good thing. And I think anybody who is in government currently uh, should take the local elections as a local election and not uh, derive too intensely uh, uh, the, a general mood uh, that people will express in this regard in the next uh, general election. And I hope it doesn't come too quickly, although there are always then rumors when the local election goes in a certain way and doesn't pass uh, the expectations of those who are in government that they might have an anticipated election, I wouldn't recommend that uh, uh, to, to have that. So uh, for us, the, um, the uh, uh, agenda is independent of who is in charge uh, the same. We will support the real, the real uh, reformers. We will address uh, deficits that we identify. We will also call a spade a spade. And uh, in the sense that we will also point at individual persons who are uh, in influential positions, who are not, uh, so to say, um, uh, delivering how they should in the spirit and the text of what has been agreed with us, and uh, also what they have promised to the citizens of Ukraine. Because ultimately, our approach and that of those who are elected in Ukraine is to serve the people and to give them a better perspective uh, uh, to make Ukraine a functioning normal democracy uh, where the people uh, see that uh, whom they are voting for are delivering and that is uh, our constant agenda and we join ranks with all those who in Ukraine have the same agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you and, and I think um, before we open Q&A to the audience, because there were quite important points raised by uh, uh, Ms. von Kramer and by Mr. Geller, maybe Ola Stefanishina, the Vice Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration, would like to reflect on some of those. But uh, while she turns on her microphone, if you could unmute yourself, if any of you who are right now joining us as the attendees on Zoom or watching us on Facebook, please send your questions <laughs> via chat and then we'll try to answer as many as we can. Thank you so much, Arisa. I'm, I, I was really willing to reflect on so many things. And uh, uh, first of all, um, I, I want to start with saying that I really um, uh, adore members of parliament, whether it's a European parliament or Ukrainian, and to, to a very good um, uh, to, uh, inspiration, I really sometimes envy to the, the extent uh, that uh, uh, members of the parliament can be free in their expressions. And I uh, really can convey that the, the uh, pleas and uh, uh, letters uh, uh, conveyed to Ukra Ukrainian parliament and the uh, party Slogana Rodo and Davida Rahamia, uh, they were well addressed and they brought more uh, European aspiration in our parliament. And basically, um, uh, I hardly can remember uh, when it was that David Rakhamia has been thinking about European Union for the whole day after he got the letter. And uh, basically he was trying to recollect in his memory everything he was doing related to EU affairs over the last months just to address this issue. But anyway, there, there was a huge discussion and I'm, I'm really happy that there is a balance and there is a, an understanding that Ukraine moves towards, uh, towards the reform agenda. And basically we have to look, uh, we're just looking back at the things um, we've done and the legislation we've passed and the, in the uh, implementation processes, we, we can see that things are well on track. Uh, and uh, basically Katarina took out of my mouth, mouth the, uh, the phrase that uh, 
um, uh, we really passed the time for sexy reforms. Uh, all the sexy reforms were, for which everybody wanted to vote, uh, they have already been passed. The establishment of the energy efficiency fund, the establishment of different institutions, which are not, uh, which were subject to consensus of everybody. But when it comes to hard agenda, uh, it's now what is exactly happening in Ukraine is the land reform, uh, the uh, amendments to the legislation on the banking reform, uh, the uh, unbundling of NEFTA gas, which has been completed, the unbundling of energy, um, uh, electricity regulator. So this is something which requires a really strong commitment. And believe me, I myself participate in this heavy discussions between principal stakeholders of this country. And it's not an easy one. I say, uh, say, but that's good that uh, Ukraine is still on the agenda and the, and the look precise is there. Um, and uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, Orisa mentioned that uh, it's, it was the first time when Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine EU summit declaration had the phrases related to vested interests uh, to be, but to be more precise, so there was a warning on deoligarchization. It's and basically, uh, this was a bit of like a provocation from the European Union when we were discuss discussing the, uh, the declaration, but it was the, exactly the time uh, when it really addressed our feeling, because we, uh, back in Kiev, were about to vote on some principal pieces of legislation, uh, or which exactly de-oligarchized our market in different sectors. And, and this was a very conscious decision to do this wording, and it was from the bottom of our heart. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, it was very good to have this uh, uh, presentation and remarks from uh, Madam uh, Viola von Kraven. And um, uh, there are so many assumptions uh, which, have, which has been stated about the uh, reformers and, and about the anti-corruption reform. And I think that it's important and with what, what is felt that we're really lacking communication and Ukrainian authorities are not uh, very vocal on the things uh, and the processes which are ongoing. Although uh, information attacks are here, we have a lot of uh, institutions and organizations who are uh, on a permanent basis uh, continue this uh, um, uh, information attacks. And even sometimes it comes to the political parties who provoke this agenda. And I want to say that uh, it is done consciously, uh, not uh, by criticizing, but uh, undermining uh, and uh, uh, provoking the international community to react in this way. And we should be conscious about that. And this is like actually uh, the discussion, the quite uh, uh, a piece of discussions we had back, uh, back uh, with the president, with the prime minister, um, that we really, uh, have to learn ourselves to communicate the reforms, the agenda, and nobody thinks that Ukrainian uh, officials are by default good professional and uh, uh, let's say democratically oriented. We have this understanding now that it should be communicated and should be visualized. And that's why exactly president over the press conference in Brussels, but also during the summit was very vocal on the reform of judiciary and corruption institutions the Commission on Special Anti-Corruption Prosecution was launched with the participation of all the foreign stakeholders, EU, um, US experts and um, other colleagues. Uh, the uh, the um, article at the, one of the biggest Ukrainian uh, EU-related affairs uh, internet edition uh, was published by Deputy Head of the Presidential Office, Minister of Justice and uh, had a parliamentary committee for, ju for justice on the vision on the reformed agenda in the judiciary. And this is a strong signal about the unity, coordination and strong agenda. And uh, we're really putting a lot of focus on communication. My personal task was to convey the necessity to communicate, to be vocal. It's very important, but it's very good. And I always say to, to my colleagues back in parliament, but also in the presidential office, that it's very good that uh, we're being criticized or uh, being talked off because uh, it means that uh, that there is uh, no, uh, that like uh, somebody cares about Ukraine, somebody cares uh, about reform. And when it is European Parliament, it's twice as important. So uh, I, would, uh, I would be happy to, to hear more about Ukraine, to get more exchange about that. 
uh, uh, but at the same time to to try to seek this for this informational balance where it is justified by facts uh, or where it is not. And of course, we have just just to finish a, a very there were so so many remarks uh, I really need to reflect on. Yeah, but I also want uh, to bring in the audience if you don't. Yes, mind. yes. And, uh, another very quick remark on the Belarus. Uh, and uh, on the Eastern Partnership generally. Uh, now I think it's the the, uh, the perfect time to reconsider the Eastern Partnership because there are objective uh, circumstances which understand that no longer it might exist in this format just to put it into the discussion. Sorry, and thank you so much. Yeah. I think that maybe will be a next event. How what, what do Ukraine what Ukraine expects and how uh, this in partnership can be mo modified. Uh, but you know, I, I, Ukraine strikes me as one of the most open country to its vulnerabilities. I mean, Ukraine says yes, we have these problems. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, the the old uh, forces, the the if you want the Soviet system that was so entrenched in Ukraine and then incomplete reforms fighting back, but. Uh, uh, there are indeed many young professionals like Olga and others who are across different agencies trying to, to do something good for the country. But I see also Vadim Halichuk, who is, uh, who is on the legislative side of Ukrainian reforms. And uh, this is where a lot of uh, things are being uh, you know, stopped very often. Uh, uh, it's not so easy to um, have the majority needed for quite difficult laws uh, on, on some of the issues, including on environment and, uh, and, and anti-corruption. So, uh, Vadim, if you can uh, join us for three minute remarks and then we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, will be brief. Uh, I, I'd like to start by saying uh, thank you to the organizers for arranging this uh, very needed, very timely, very important event. Uh, we certainly need to, as, as we've just heard, uh, lots of comments on different issues, different aspects of uh, our cooperation. We certainly need to go aspect by aspect, area of cooperation by area of cooperation in order for everyone to be able to uh, express their thoughts, which are very important. Uh, and I thank uh, uh, my dear colleagues the, uh, from the European Parliament, uh, those who have uh, praised our reforms, which was uh, uh, music to my ears and those who have been pretty critical about the uh, activities of uh, both, well, actually all, all of us, the parliament and the president's office and, uh, uh, and the government, because uh, those are also very important for us to sort of uh, understand how well we're doing. And I completely agree with uh, Olha Stefanishina who had, uh, uh, who had given a very good explanation, I think, uh, as to uh, how badly we do our communications because uh, since remarks like that uh, are coming, coming out more often, uh, we understand the difficulties of, of the whole communication, uh, information war that Ukraine is in. And that unfortunately, that war is not only uh, instigated from outside of Ukraine, but we have a lot of that going inside of Ukraine. And uh, it is our responsibility to be uh, much better at communications, which I, uh, I promise to do. On the legislative part, uh, I, I don't want to repeat what has already been done. Uh, it, it was said enough, and uh, I'm happy to hear that our colleagues in the European Parliament also have the same opinion that uh, certainly we have uh, despite the, the, all the difficulties that were there, we have moved forward uh, significantly and uh, we have shown the capability to move forward more. Uh, the Mono majority is, is far from being uh, over as some are trying to put it. Uh, we have a very, very strong presence uh, in terms of how many MPs are in the faction and are voting uh, all, all the needed laws uh, and, and uh, supporting the party discipline, so to speak, but it's also very indicative uh, how many MPs from other different factions are joining in. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that the whole uh, approximation of the legislation each which, issue, which is the uh, responsibility of the parliament is in good hands. Now, as the result of the summit where uh, we reiterated that it's, uh, the, the course is irreversible. Uh, association agreement is the frame for Ukrainian reforms. Uh, we have found the next areas for 
to, to focus on uh, the trade, the sectorial cooperation, uh, the uh, Green Deal, where Ukraine could be very, uh, very important and very, uh, uh, very good partner. Uh, and of course, the defense issue. One of the very important results of the summit was uh, the language, I think, in which the final statements were drafted regarding uh, the Russian aggression, regarding the support that Ukraine is getting uh, in, in, on, on those fronts, and regarding the support uh, of uh, what we think could be the next big thing, to, to, so to speak, uh, is the uh, Crimean platform. Uh, the idea of President Zelensky uh, to uh, put more focus on that specific issue since it has been uh, somewhat, uh, at least in the uh, uh, in information uh, uh, area, it has been sort of pushed aside, to say. So there, we were very happy to see, uh, to hear, uh, the support of our European uh, Union friends uh, to to make that uh, a uh, more powerful platform to to deal with the issues that we have. Um, the focus on trade, the focus on Green Deal, the defense issues, uh, the promises that the uh, uh, the APCA agreement, the, the mission will be uh, will be completed soon, and we we could move forward is very important for us, uh, for parliamentarians to, uh, I don't want to use the word justify, but it, it sort of explains what we need to do uh, since, uh, and it, it's been already voiced, the concern that uh, Ukrainian people and political elites uh, do have a certain task of uh, sort of justifying where we're heading uh, with the European Union. Uh, we're not on. We're not in negotiations about the partnership right now. We, we're not ready. We, which is, we understand what it is. But that raises the issue: why? Why is it that we need to bring our legislation, for example, on par with the European law, uh, since we're not part of the European Union, and since since it's not the uh, uh, the, the task number one for today? Uh, some ask so. Uh, justifying that, explaining that, and getting people on, on board, including the members of parliament, uh, is a big task. And it's great that we have received these uh, very, very clear messages on, uh, with a focus on sectorial cooperation and what it will bring, what it will give Ukraine in terms of uh, reforms of our economy, reforms uh, in general, and uh, the growth in prosperity for, for our people. Uh, so overall, uh, I, I do uh, agree with those who uh, mark the, uh, uh, who say the uh, uh, summit was a success. It does bring us forward uh, in terms of uh, being uh, more focused on the areas of cooperation, and that already had an, uh, uh, had a very positive effect. We have, uh, we are at the final stage of completing the roadmap. The parliament, the parliament, government, and presidential office uh, plan, legislative plan, where we had all the committees in the parliament, where we had the government and the president's office uh, agree on a very specific list and priorities on those lists for the legislation that needs to be approximated very first. So very soon we will be delivering uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 focuses, the the, the priorities, and Hopefully, uh, we understand the limitations that the pandemic uh, has created, uh, but hopefully the next session, the November 3 session and those that will follow will not fall under those, will not be failed by those restrictions. And we will be voting very important legislation needed for approximation purposes and generally for uh, our association obligations every session, every week that we have vote, votings in the parliament. I'll, uh, I'll stop at Thank that. You I understand much. you have a lot of people to come in. Yeah, th th thanks, Vadim. I think it's, it's excellent to hear that there is this momentum uh, and we, we wish you to keep it going. It's so important, especially in the view of what Mr. Geller said about the possible turbulence that could come in the political life of Ukraine after the local elections. I think he, he said some very wise words about what it means, you know, local elections and what it means national politics, because there are a lot of rumors about possible early elections or some other, you know, uh, political crisis in Ukraine. So we do hope that you keep the defenses and that you keep, keep Ukraine on track.
and keep the social cohesion of the country going. So while we are gathering some of the questions and we really only have 10 minutes, I would like to uh, bring in uh, Roman Vashchuk, who is the uh, uh, member of the Ukrainian World Congress. Uh, he serves on the Foreign Policy Council, um, and, but he is mostly known, of course, for many in Ukraine as the former ambassador of Canada to Ukraine. He served for five years in Kiev. Uh, so, Romana, vam slovo. Thanks. Uh, I think a lot of good points have been made. Uh, the question of uh, mentioned by Mr. Halechuk of the next big thing, uh, both Ukraine and the EU, I think, face a sort of narrative issue. Uh, as Orisha mentioned, the public opinion stats, clearly the opponents of reform and European integration have found a narrative. You're poor, you're miserable, you're unhappy, how do you feel? Not good. Uh, I agree with Katrina Maternova that boring is good, but boring is not compelling. And uh, it's obviously incumbent on the very communications oriented people in the Ukrainian presidential administration, but maybe on the somewhat less communications oriented people on the European side to find a common master narrative that punches through uh, to Ukrainians who glaze over at the first mention of acronyms and long complex uh, 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 documents that, that are that are under discussion. So, so I'm wondering whether, uh, quite apart from the substance, which needs to be fixed uh, in Ukraine by parliamentarians and the president, uh, and that is under constant review in Brussels, whether there is a kind of master narrative uh, work being done to ensure that people who are favorable to European integration, uh, know what they're supporting and are able to share that with their compatriots. And for that matter, uh, with diaspora communities that are wondering what's going on and what are we supporting? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Maybe for this it would be great to hear a reflection from Kiev and from EU. So I don't know who would like to take it. For, uh, maybe we'll start on the EU side because Vadim kind of spoke to that and then we'll go to Kiev. Viola, would you like to comment whether the EU also needs to better communicate its vision for the region, for the people in the region and what it offers? Do you think there is any problem with that? Well, I, I'm not so sure whether this is a communication uh, thing, but of course, when I've uh, received the answer uh, from, from some of the colleagues in the RADA who obviously are not so much aware of what actually the treaties and the um, the um, yeah the the um, association agreement is is really about and what it means and as Michael has said before it's not because we think this is a good idea but I guess it would be everything what is in the association agreement in in, in the different pillars is part of the reform agenda which improves in the end the standard of living for each and every Ukrainian citizen. And this is something I would like to lay out in, in uh, like examples, giving example what it means if we support uh, health reforms, what it means for the people on the ground, especially outside of Kiev and why we do have to stick to this and why is it important. When we speak about um, Corona crisis and we see there are a lot of cases, not all of them are, I mean, you find in the statistics, because there are now the pneumonia cases in the south of uh, Odessa you have never seen before and in other oblasts. So, of course, there are hidden figures which we do not really get out. But the health, uh, if we had a more successful health reform before, I think we could have saved life. And this is what matters. So when we work on common er uh, reform agendas, it's not because we have get anything out of it. We don't earn more money if uh, the better, uh, the, the education or the health uh, constitution of the people are better off afterwards. And this is something <clears throat> we have to explain a little bit better. Procurement for Corona uh, protective equipment and the attempts of the current health minister uh, to, I mean, really bribe people to, to uh, pay a three uh, percent, uh, 300 percent more and, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, 
who is gonna who is gonna win from this and this really matters because we can save lives or we can't save lives and so we have to explain to the people what is on stake if we have a government що не є відданий власним. Yes. Thank you very much and I see May I come in? Yes. Yeah, yes, please. I just wanted to bring you in because I also know that May I may yeah. I come in because I'm Yes, please. Now I, you're in the car. Why are you you're us, really uh, juggling uh, you in the example I'm in a car. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> and I have to run to another meeting so very very briefly and and uh, I also uh, uh, obviously uh, someone from the commission is much less free to speak um than uh, a member of the european parliament but i will i will actually dare to disagree on this point with viola uh if if you allow me i i i i think the point that roman made is absolutely valid uh the 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 job is boring and we need the narrative and i think thanks for giving me the idea we are going to give a thing to it you know some thought to it how to how to better communicate because i think that the points that viola has been making they're all valid i mean there are there are failings in in many different places and one can always come up with the with the the the, the, the you know areas that need improvement absolutely cases that need prosecution completely agree but one thing that we need to keep in mind and i in fact uh, uh, wrote an article on it for the book on uh, reforms that was uh, published in toronto at the at the at the summit or at the ukraine conference that we had hosted by the canadian government the adoption of the acquis that is in the association agreement and the dcfta is actually extremely far reaching and it was done on the basis of completely different geopolitical situation with completely different set of expectations it was at a time when many people certainly in the region and many in the eu viewed the eastern partnership as a as a as an anteroom to expansion and as an anteroom to to enlargement since then reality kicked in europe is in a different place we say very openly eastern partnership is not about enlargement and i think the point that the colleague from the rada made is a very valid one why the hell do we need to adopt this or that piece of legislation if we are not and nowhere near being members of the eu and i think what we need to recognize is that we ourselves never put the 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 prioritization and sequencing that should go into the adoption as you get closer to the eu we just put it all in there and that's why i what we are now trying to do through our policy dialogue and through our assistance is to now bring in uh, uh focus on the key areas of um of reforms that are not part of the aki with all due respect viola all the areas that you are pointing to very legitimately as problematic for example uh, uh, you know the way the healthcare is organized is not part of the aki the aki is not on the fundamentals and what we needed to and what we still need to help ukraine is to reform the fundamentals whether it's the rule of law whether it's the economic uh development but its institutions public administrations these are areas where we are involved and they cannot be found and there is no roadmap for them in the aki because the aki is a result of member states legislating for themselves where they don't need to work well some of them would need to work on fundamentals but it's a different debate yeah and and so i i i honestly disagree with the notion just follow the agreements and you will find answers to to the societal problems i think the communication issue is important the narrative is important not sure we will come up with it but yeah. hopefully together with ukrainians yet and now i have to run i apologize yeah. i i think it's no surprise that in the just a uh, comment. yes yeah I, i will let you in ola and i think viola has a finger so i also give her one uh, one minute to say no okay but uh it's it's no surprise that uh, in the anti in the vested interest the state the sentence in the joint statement there's a mention of pluralistic media because i think there's a quite strong backlash of 
uh, those who are those who have Western interests and who own media channels that are spinning anti-Western narratives inside Ukraine. And I think having such a toxic media environment requires European partners and Ukraine actually. And, and this is why I also want to ask Olya because Ukraine usually has communication strategy around European and Euro-Atlantic integration to explain its citizens what is at stake and what is the cost actually of not reforming. Is there such an option that it's not just, you know, uh, some complicated IKEA of the EU, but it's about your own well-being. So uh, maybe you can comment on that. Thank you, Arisa. Um, uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, we touched upon some issues which should be subject to additional round of this kind of discussion. Uh, and uh, Roman was saying about the country of happy people who would be happy and traditional in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian people don't like politicians, even though they vote for them, but they don't like politicians. They don't like what they do, whatever they do, uh, whether it's good, uh, good or bad, but they like you uh, and uh, our partners. And, uh, you know, uh, I just recently received the uh, so, 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 sociological uh, review uh, done by the National Democratic Institute, who's a very reliable partner for uh, many years. And uh, subject to the end of the August of this year, support for EU and NATO integration is the strongest since, since 2014. So there is understanding that um, uh, uh, situation will unlikely to change, and uh, it is unlikely that Ukrainian citizens will start loving politicians, especially where we have such a contradictory media and such different messages are spread through the uh, blue screens. Uh, but uh, 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 message, uh, messages and support and the new big deals proposed by the EU and supported by the EU and NATO would serve as a, as a very strong signal. And for example, if we're talking about uh, membership action plan on NATO would bring immediately all the agenda related to a transformation, security and defense sector are positive because everything which would be done would be done based on the membership action plan. The same goes to you. So, so we need those big deals and we need this positive uh, uh, messages from the from the foreign partners and we deserve to them to some extent and one uh, very last point to, to say it's like part of each and every comment I have Ukraine is a huge country it's a huge country and some of the Ukrainian regions are as big as some uh, EU member countries so when we speak about communication and information campaigns we should not forget about that we invest heavily in that but, uh, but there are so many others who are also investing on that. So uh, the support is there and we can make people happier by showing bilateral commitment. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think we will be wrapping up as we are running out of time. Uh, Paul, would you like to say a few words be before we close down? From Toronto. Yes, thank you, uh, Oresha, and thank you all. Uh, this has been a very insightful panel. And we're certainly taking advantage of the opportunity to gather more frequently and discuss these, these key issues. Uh, as I mentioned in my early remarks, the uh, Ukrainian World Congress has member organizations all over Europe and the Ukrainian uh, communities are growing uh, in Europe. And they certainly have a vested interest to see a, a bringing closer together of uh, Ukraine and the, and the EU. Uh, what we're looking for is a clear uh, roadmap to, uh, to EU uh, uh, membership, and as well uh, in terms of Ukraine's ability to actually uh, prepare itself for that EU uh, membership. So we're going to be, as, uh, as uh, Ukraine, as civil society, holding everyone's feet to the fire, uh, ensuring that on the Ukrainian government side uh, and the, the, the appropriate reforms and legislative reforms are being implemented and also working with our European uh, parliamentarians and colleagues to ensure that there is a clear uh, support for Ukraine's uh, membership into the EU. So thank you all very much for participating. Odisha, thank you for your moderation and uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion with all of you on this very important issue. Thank you very much and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you for all taking your time to speak and share from, from different capitals. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day and stay well. Buďte zdorovi. Good to see you all. Do pobačenja. Do pobačenja.